This is the Northamptonshire Carers Podcast. Hello and a warm welcome to the Northamptonshire Carers Podcast. This is episode four for May 2023. And this is actually quite a a bumper edition of the podcast because there are two significant events that, although not happening in May, they do happen at the beginning part of June, hence covering them in this podcast. So we have Volunteers Week, which runs from the 1st to the 7th of June, and Carers Week from the 5th to the 11th of June. So we've got quite a lot of material to cover both of those. So uh, Gwyn Roberts, who's our Chief Operating Officer, will be talking in a moment about Carers Week and generally what that's all about and what we tend to do uh, each, uh, each year for Carers Week. A number of our volunteers will be talking about why they volunteer for us. And from the 15th to the 21st of May, it's Mental Health Awareness Week. The focus is on anxiety this time around. And I'll be talking about that in brief towards uh, the latter part of the podcast. Plus, we'll be talking to one of our volunteers who has gone from being a carer to volunteering and a carer who gets support from our former carers group, Horizons. So there's lots to pack in. So it's probably wise for me to say very little other than if you want to talk about your own story as uh, a carer, then we'd be happy to have a chat with you and perhaps feature that on a future podcast. Any ideas or suggestions for what we might cover on future episodes, that would be great. You can contact us on podcast at northamptonshire-carers.org or call the office on 01933 677 907. Or as I always say, you can have a chat with us wherever you may come across us across the county. So let's uh, start with a uh, bit of a brief on Carers Week from Gwyn, our Chief Operating Officer here at Northamptonshire Carers. So I wanted uh, to get you to have a chat with us about Carers Week, when that's happening, what it's all about, I suppose, because I know it's a national campaign. Mm-hmm and what we're doing on a more local level during that time. Yes, uh, Carers Week is the sort of the national awareness raising for unpaid carers uh, event across uh, the country. It runs every June, uh, so this year it's uh, the 5th of June to the 11th, that's Monday the 5th uh, kicks off. Uh, um, and so we're, we're we're joining so with the so national charities, but also doing lots of things very much in the, the local communities to both raise awareness for carers, that we know that there's a lot of carers who might be providing care for many years, don't necessarily know the, what the term carer means, and more importantly, don't know there's necessarily support out there uh, for them. So it's a chance for that awareness raising. There'll be, say, probably as well as the national campaign, uh, locally, the, the events that we're running. The, the, the hope is that uh, carers themselves or people who know carers or professionals working uh, with care, uh, carers will sort of notice them and uh, um, refer them for support, point them in, 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 in our direction for support and for other uh, charities who, who can support them or, or other services. And uh, also, it's it's such an opportunity to put on a lot of activities, which are for the carers that we are supporting, the carers that we've supported for many years, to put a menu of events on, which give give carers a break, a bit of a something to do outside of caring. And I know that I think one of the things that's happening during that time, I can't remember whether it's at the beginning or the end, is the uh, uh, last night of the proms uh, event, isn't there? Yes, so that's actually a couple of weeks later, uh, towards the end of uh, of June. Uh, but um, but yeah, we're, that's part of Carers Week, and it's something which actually arose from Carers Week probably about eight, eight or nine years ago now. But we've actually got the the Castle Theatre in uh, Wellingborough uh, booked for that. So if anyone that been there, it's, a, it's an impressive uh, venue, and it shows how how much the, 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 the our carers choir which is sort of made up of carers and we work with the local music, musicians have, have, have developed over the years so that's been running for a, a you know, good 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 number of years now and um, it's just a really fun event it, you know as you say from the title it sort of t- it takes on some of the themes of uh, last night of the proms um, down in London but put, put our own local uh, spin on it and uh, it's a great opportunity for carers who come along to the choir uh, every week um, to actually shine in front of an audience. Sure, yeah. And if um, 
anyone listening thinks uh oh that sounds really great i want to find out about some of the things that are going on find out more etc then where, where should they head um, the best thing, if, if someone's online, if you can go onto our website, northamptonshire-carers.org, uh, there's a, so a tab there uh, dedicated to Carers Week, and it's got a whole menu of events, including the proms. We've got something there like uh, a, golf, a golf day, which is uh, uh, always uh, popular. Um, we're doing some local uh, activities with GP surgeries, so I know in Long Book, working with them on their sort of carers and veterans uh, drop-in. There's uh, events with other organisations such as SERV, we're doing some uh, joint, joint working. Uh, so we've got a ho- whole host of activities around, around the county, um, in every corner of the county. So there's a, a drop-in in, in Blackthorn, for example. But we've got um, a tea dance uh, for, national, for National Carers Week, uh, one in Kettering and one in Wenneborough. For parent carers, for those who are... Uh, maybe supporting a sort of child with a uh, sort of a disability or additional needs. We've got a, a Carers Week uh, lunch, which is sort of a, you know, have a chance to have a, sort of a bite to eat, uh, uh, a hot drink, and uh, look, look at some crafts there as well to do. Uh, and then some of our sort of normal uh, activities are having a bit of a Carers Week uh, spin on them. So. Uh, for example, we've got Coffee Morning and Roads. The cinema group is uh, is on that Tuesday, and this is, we've even got a, a Carers Bake Off, so um, cake will be provided. That will be popular. That one, I think. Paul Hollywood's not appearing. I take it. Not that I'm aware of. No, but you never know. He might coincidentally drive by and just pop in, but uh, we, we're not expecting uh, him, but uh, it would be cool if he did. This is an open invite invitation. If Paul Hollywood has subscribed to the Northamptonshire Carers podcast, you are cordially invited, and feel free to bring Matt Lucas as well. <laughs> yeah, I think that'd be good. And I know that we've got uh, socials, as, as they're called these days, so we've got um, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, so information, I guess, is going to be on those as well as the website. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, or if you follow us on sort of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, we're on uh, all, all of those. So yeah, a lot of things will be published on there. We'll be, you know, sort of leaflets go, going out in terms of you know, in terms of GP surgeries and the like. Or you can just give us a call and uh, other, our support line can let you know what's on uh, near you if you're, if you're not uh, on the internet. This is the Northamptonshire Carers Podcast. And that was Gwyn Roberts, Chief Operating Officer here at Northamptonshire Carers. And staying with the topic of Carers Week, Rich came in to uh, have a chat and talk about his caring experiences. It's great to welcome Rich to the Northamptonshire Carers podcast. Rich got in touch after hearing that we were starting a podcast. Hi, Rich. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. I wondered if, if you might start by saying a bit about why you decided to have a chat with us. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so I'm, I'm a carer myself. And I figured it would be good for other like-minded carers who, um, other like-minded carers that can, that can benefit from anything that I find helps me cope. As we probably all know, it's very difficult, um, you know, watching a loved one or somebody you care for, having to go through what they have to go through and then trying to juggle life at the same time. It's not easy. It's not easy for anyone. But there are ways and there are methods that I use to sort of help me deal with day-to-day life and keep my head above water. So I, I figured, you know, if if I can help other carers, if, if I can help at least one carer, then happy days. And I wonder... Because it's it'd be interesting to know kind of how you got to where you are now. I suppose what was life like before, and then when did the, the caring role begin? <laughs> so, um, growing up, I was bullied a lot as a kid. Uh, basically, cutting a very long story short here. So, I'll keep it nice and brief. Uh, I was bullied as a kid. I went to secondary school. I then became a bully, and I got into trouble. I was getting arrested, all the rest of it, and then went into college. Uh, I, guess, I guess me being being the bully and being the the troublesome child was basically a defensive mechanism that I was using, and then got into college and basically sorted my life out, various relationships, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then I started working at Campfield House Immigration Removal Centre as a detainee custody officer. I was there for about eight nine years, 
and then I was in the prison service uh, and then I was in the police uh, working in police custody as a detention officer um and yeah you know I met my partner I found her on a, a dating app and we hit it off straight away I think within two weeks um I moved in with her you know usually people are sort of like you know give it a, give it time but when you know you know you know so I was always spending time around there so I figured let's do this so she was absolutely she was okay uh, there was no real medical concerns or anything like that uh, I think she had an underactive thyroid at the time but you know that's that was being medicated and treated um and yeah basically two year after two years of being together her health just rapidly declined but I love her so you know she's she's a female version of me so to speak yeah. She always wants me to be a better version of myself. So, I, you know, at the end of the day, yeah, she's got a lot of medical problems. And yeah, I have to see her hurting a lot and see her struggling a lot. And obviously, as probably a lot of people know, the NHS is um, not in a great way, to say the least. Um, so, you know, we go through these battles together and, and it is what it is. You know, you look on the positives, look on the bright side of things. I know it's not always easy when you think everything is going wrong, um, but you've got to appreciate what you have got and appreciate the little things in life, you know, to help you get through the difficult things. So, yeah, I've, I've basically, that's, I guess I kind of learned that kind of mentality and, and that kind of resilience through my line of work that I've done. Uh, obviously I had to resign from work I'm a full-time stay-at-home dad and a full-time carer to my partner we've got a three-year-old daughter together I've also got two other kids two other boys with um from previous relationships and we've got two cats as well <laughs> we got two kittens a little while ago so you know it's all go it's all fun and games but um like I said you just got to stay positive and that's half the battle bit of a left field question but uh what sort of cats have you got <laughs> they are short-haired domestic tabbies or something yeah. like that they're two boys we actually thought they were two girls first got them <laughs> we gave them girls names uh took them to the vets and the vet said um they're boys I was, and so we had to change quite a few things change, like their names you might you might have guessed that that i've got cats i've got two uh, male rescue cats three-year-old <laughs> they're good fun aren't they <laughs> these are still kittens they're not even a year old at the moment they're very they're very good fun wait waking you up at half five in the morning maybe not quite so much fun but I'm just just sort of picking up on what you're saying there. So you've got two two fairly young, what well, you've got young young youngish children, haven't you? So uh, how you know how do you juggle everything? So I've got a set routine with my boys. Obviously, they don't live with me. Currently, not seeing my youngest lad, but that's a story for another day. Um, there were some great difficulties going on with that. Not a choice I wanted to do, but you know, is what it is. Um, so I've got a set routine. Every every other weekend, I see my eldest lad. Uh, and then during obviously summer holidays and Easter holidays I have him for you know quite quite a substantially amount of time longer um, he's absolutely great he's absolutely great he helps me out you know he, he's a typical teenager he's 12 years old so you know he's all into his games and his mobile phones and all the rest of it but if I say to him look can you give me a hand here he will more than happily help sort of I've, I've been trying to raise him up to be that way to be a responsible young adult a gentleman um who is respectful, polite, helpful, all the rest of it. And he is going that way. Obviously, he's got the teenhood in him. So, um, yeah, he'll be 13 in a couple of months. But, um, yeah, he's, he's a good lad. And then, obviously, I've got my daughter as well. My daughter's absolutely smashing. She's brilliant. We get 15 hours a week uh, free childcare. So she goes to preschool. That's in our village. Um, she goes there, and she's absolutely loving that. And... Yeah, basically, I think, to be honest with you, when, when you ask me sort of how do I juggle everything, it's a case of I'll make sure everything at home is done. Now, my partner does not need 24-7 constant watch, which I know, understand will probably be a bit different for a lot of people. So, But what I do is I make sure that my partner is okay. So I make sure she's got food. Uh, she's currently on the calorie 40 sips. I make sure she's got plenty of drinks, make sure she's comfortable. If she needs to go to the toilet, I help her to the toilet. You know, if she wants to have a shower, help her with that, et cetera, et cetera. So I make sure she is 100% comfortable. I make sure everything around the house is done. And, you know, we're talking about the, the, the very basics here. I'm not talking about making sure that the whole place is redecorated because that's not essential. So for me, washing up, 
laundry, general tidiness, hoovering, all that sort of stuff. Make sure the house is in a decent state. Once everything's done, me and my daughter usually will go off to the woods and we'll take our hammocks. I'm into my wild camping. Yeah. And that's one of my coping mechanisms. You can get a cheap hammock off eBay, Amazon, wherever, for about 16, 17 pounds, just a cheap one. It'll come with everything you need, strap it up to two trees, and just swinging in a hammock in the middle of the woods in peace and quiet in nature is the best therapy you can get. It's hitting that reset button. And, and when I can, you know, when, when uh, the mother-in-law um, is available and she's, you know, she can have Ivy, that's my daughter, Ivy, uh, when she can have her overnight, uh, I'll go off for a camp and I'll go camping in the woods and I'll just go by myself. As I'm sure you imagine, it's not that peaceful when you take a three-year-old to the woods. <laughs> so um, when I can, I do go camping, um, even if it's in the back garden. You know, it, it's, I live in a village, so it's nice and quiet. But yeah, for me, it's a reset button. I go there, I have no responsibilities. Obviously, I have my phone on loud. If my partner does need me, and if my partner does need me, then I'll pack up and I'll come home. But I make sure things are in place that, to make sure everybody is okay. And that, that, that sort of is about building or maintaining your resilience, I suppose, isn't it, as well? Do you, do you get that opportunity to have that reset, as you describe it, sort of fairly regularly then? Yeah, yeah, relatively regularly. Um, not as regularly as I'd like. Obviously, I'd like to go camping every week, but, um, you know, it is what it is. At the end of the day, I, I've got responsibilities to take care of. And... I know this might be a, 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 a difficult uh, one in a sense, but how, how, how does, does your wife cope with the fact that things have changed su such a lot for her? Um, so to begin with, she used to be a, a HCA working at a hospital in Erfling, or, or Wellingborough, sorry. And she loved her job. She loved her job so much. She worked hard. She worked well. She worked on a stroke rehabilitation ward, and uh, she was very proud of her work and what she did. Um, and she's very, very knowledgeable. So she loved her job, really loved her job. So when the day came when she was deemed medically unfit to work, it crushed her. It was horrible. She, she, she hated it because she's such a, you know, her mental frame of mind is get up, get stuff done, keep active. Yeah. And now her body is saying, no, you're not doing that. Whereas her mind is still like, get up, get going, get active, her body's like, no, you're not doing that. I'm going to cause you this pain. I'm going to cause you that pain. I'm going to stop you from doing this. So for Sammy, it was a very hard pill to swallow. And it, it did take time for her to, um, to accept it. it. It took a long time for her to accept it. Um, she says that without me, she, she wouldn't be here. <laughs> so, you know, for, for someone to tell me that, that was... Um, that hit home. That 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 really meant something. Um, so yeah, it was a very hard pill for her to swallow. Uh, and I think the most frustrating thing at the moment is obviously the waiting times at NHS to get an appointment. Uh, and then when you do go to the appointment, the consultants don't listen. They prescribe medication that makes you scratch your head you know um not as a side effect but as like why why would you prescribe me this um so there's a lot of things that don't make sense and obviously with sammy being so medically knowledgeable yeah. Yeah. there's a lot of things that happen that she's like that shouldn't happen you know that should not be yeah. um so it's very difficult yeah. to just roll over and accept that this is the treatment she's going to get yeah. and uh this is her life is 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 the a part of it as well that that is that is there a continuity of seeing the same person or is it a different person quite often See, obviously she she has her specialists and she has her go-tos um so you know she's got a specialist for each medical problem that she has um but they do tend to swap and change uh and that's not due to you know anything sammy's decided it's 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 due to them running out of ideas, them running out of solutions. So they'll refer her to somebody who's a little bit more knowledgeable. Um, and also, you know, doctors and consultants and that retiring as well. Um, she'll get referred on to other people. Um, 
so yeah, she does have her set consultants, but it means she's been on a merry-go-round for a long time, seeing this person, that person, and all the rest of it. Um, it, it hopefully now it's kind of a case where she's got the consultants sorted. That, and and how, how does does your daughter cope with this? Or, or, or obviously she's see, seeing a mum not being very very well, not yeah. being able to do the things that that maybe she would like to be able to do sometimes. You know, with, with with Ivy, that's kind of what she's grown up with. My partner was was not very well before we had Ivy. During the pregnancy, my partner was fine. All all her symptoms just sort of subsided while she was pregnant, um, and then obviously once Ivy was born, they all came screaming back. So our daughter has grown up with it, and it is it is sad, of course, you know. But it's it's Ivy doesn't mind. She she's accepted the reality that she's been brought into you know that she knows and it's harder on my partner because this is her first child and she cannot be the mum that she wants to be that must be so incredibly difficult for for sammy 100 percent, 100 percent. i can't even imagine how difficult that must be um so that's that's tough because she can't play with her, she can't pick her up as such. Um, you know, she can't go on days out and take her for bike rides and do what normal mums would do, so to speak. Um, so I think it's harder on my partner, definitely. Um, my daughter is very understanding. She looks after her. She looks after Sammy. Um, you know, she she basically Ivy's grown up around me, and I'm I'm obviously. Sammy's care I'm a very caring person and I love her to pieces so I look after mummy as much as possible and she sees that and she does the same she's got a little doctor set that she's got a little stethoscope a little you know play thermometer and that and she'll come in and check on mummy and you know she's so she's our daughter is our medicine whenever we're having a bad day she'll cheer us up in a in two seconds she's absolutely phenomenal she is she is the light in our lives there's no doubt about it She's amazing. Sounds like she really keeps you both going. I wondered though if you have family or friends that maybe are around to be able to give you support. I know you mentioned uh, your mother-in-law a little bit earlier on. Yeah, so I mean, my family have have kind of gone their own separate ways. They live far away. Um, I don't really see them much. I don't get a lot of support from them. Um, so. You know they've they've got their own lives at the end of the day. Um, like I'll always say throughout this podcast is it is what it is. So yeah, my my partner, her mum, dad, and sisters they live locally. So we live in a little village called Braunston, and they live in Daventry. Um, but obviously they've got their own commitments as well. You know, so her sister Danielle. Um, hi Danielle. <laughs> um she has got a little boy ted um who's i think he's two yeah. two years old uh, and she's got another one on the way uh her sister laura she's obviously working she's got her own little family um and her mum and dad have got their own health conditions and they've got their own responsibilities as well so this in terms of support network her family are amazing you know there there is nothing they won't do for their family and I'm included in that yeah. which is an absolute honor for me um so I yeah I you know in, in terms of support if Sammy needs to go in a hospital and I need somebody to have Ivy it's done you know regardless of the situation regardless if they have work the next day they'll 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 speak to work and arrange annual leave or, or whatever it may be so um we make it work together and we're we're all a team as a family should be so it's it's fantastic is there anything else that that that, that you do I mean, is this stuff that you i don't know you really enjoy watching something on tv or listening to something on the radio or music or anything that that also gives you a bit of a bit of me time i suppose yeah absolutely yeah music music's a huge one yeah. and i actually i've written a bit of a list here <laughs> of different things that help me for me helps with every single occasion um so if I'm angry, I'll listen to heavy metal. <laughs> and it helps me get some of that anger out. You know, obviously that's not everybody's cup of tea. Uh, you know, but um, if it, it works for me, I love it. I love heavy metal. Um, so it works for me. 
and there's various different bands you know if you are sort of into that and you don't know about these bands but there are various bands of like hate breed um just listen to the lyrics you know a lot of people think it's all about shouting and 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 you know all that sort of nastiness and a lot of dark stuff but hate breed is all about sort of being the best version of yourself and not being your own defeatist and you know just just keeping your head above water basically so it's massive help massive massive help and there's a load of other bands as well um and then <laughs> on the other end of the scale i like to listen to country music i absolutely love country music uh, and nine times out of ten that's what i'll be listening to i was listening on the way up here what i like about it is not necessarily the blues side of it it's more of the jumpy bouncy sort of side of it and that helps me keep my spirits up and keeps me bouncing and you know singing along and all the rest of it and keeps me in good spirits music is massive it's so good what about tv and streaming more music for me i mean obviously i do watch tv i watch tv series and, and movies and stuff like that but i wouldn't say they have benefit towards me um obviously during the evenings when when my daughter's in bed i go to bed you know at half seven eight o'clock i'm in bed and that's that's my me time that's my relax um you know i've got a bad back as it is so for me to be able to relax in the evenings and just be with my partner because obviously during the day i'm with my daughter you know we're out and about we're doing shopping we're doing cleaning we're doing this that and the other and i don't really see my partner a lot during the day obviously i'll pop in and i'll make sure she's okay and if she needs me i'm there the majority of the time i'm with my daughter the evening is my time to spend with her you know and sometimes we'll sit there and we'll chat to each other until like one o'clock in the morning just talking absolute crap um or we'll be sat there and we'll watch our own thing and that's okay. We're just in each other's company. We're quite happy. So, um, you know, in terms of TV, there's, you know, I can I can recommend some TV series and stuff that I find good. Beneficial for a carer? Probably not so much. Um, but, they, you know, it's entertainment purposes, isn't it? It's it's not to empower somebody. It's not to help somebody. Something you can get lost in. Well, you're not sat there worrying. And I understand, obviously, there's medication that needs to be issued. There's certain tasks throughout the day that need to be done. But if you schedule your day and set an alarm, I've got about 15 alarms on my phone. I mean, I've got ADHD, so my memory's terrible. I need alarms. I can't, I can't read. I can read, like I can read, but I can't focus. I, I, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that will read the same page about four nice. times <laughs> before yeah. I actually yeah. understand what's actually been written. Um, so yeah, you set alarms on your phone. And, and if you've got a spare hour, do what makes you happy. Don't just sit there worrying because that's not helping anybody. It's definitely not helping. Yeah. So if you've got an hour in a day, plan your day. How long do certain things take? And this is something I'm still getting to grips to because I have no concept of time. Like if I was to clean the kitchen, and my partner will back me up on this, if I'm to say, right, tomorrow I'm cleaning the kitchen, that will be my day. And even though cleaning the kitchen will take an hour, <laughs> but for me, I'm like, that's a day. That's a whole day I need to clean the kitchen. That's what I'm doing. Um, so I have no real concept of time. So you know, writing things down and scheduling stuff out and having a routine definitely helps you find time for yourself. It's important. Yeah, it's so important to recharge your own batteries. You've got to look after yourself because the way I look at it is I am the pillar that's holding our family up. And if I'm not looking after myself, then the whole thing will crumble. And, you know, so I need to look after myself. I have to make sure that I'm in a mentally fit state and I'm decent and I can look after my family as best as I can. I have my moments, I have my low days, I have my days where I can't be bothered or days where I just don't want to do it or whatever. Um, but it's about accepting that, recognising that and overcoming that. Just jumping back a bit to talking about resilience and how you are able to to maintain that have you got any ideas or or suggestions uh, further for people that you think might be be helpful if you're in a caring role it's also i think it's beneficial to hear other people's stories because if you're sat there thinking this is how can this get any worse and then you hear somebody over's story and they're going for a lot worse than you it really puts things into perspective and I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying I'm the worst off. That is, without a shadow of doubt, not correct. Um, 
But for other people to hear other people's stories, I think it's so important to be like, I'm not on my own. Other people are dealing with this sort of stuff and dealing with these kind of worries and dealing with these kind of concerns and stresses. Um, this is how they deal with it. So maybe I'll give that a go. That sounds interesting. And I think it would be very beneficial for other people to to, to sort of have somewhere where they can go. Which is why I love this, po this podcast that you're doing is because people have somewhere to go where they can get information, help and advice because it's not always something at the forefront of their mind. It's, rela it's all relatable conversation, isn't it? I think what you're referring to there is that kind of peer support in many ways. I know that you've got some particular ideas as well. I know these are what help for you and you recognise that everyone's caring role is different, but they may be useful to other carers. So accept and adjust. And that's all you can do. Because if you just sit there and dwell on it and, and you know, have a cry and woe is me and all the rest of it, that's not going to change the situation. It's not going to help you in any way. It, you've you've got to... For your own mental state, you've just got to accept what is unchangeable and make the best of it, make the best of a bad situation. You know what I mean? And that's that's just how I deal yeah. with it. It is what it is. And another thing I forgot to add uh, is going to the gym, uh, fitness and health. So I, I suffer with depression. I'm on medication for depression. Now, when I go to the gym, and I lift weights or I do some form of exercise, um, that helps so much, so much, because like reading a book, it's just you. You know, you put your music on and it's just you. And you, the only responsibilities you've got is working out. Now, what I will say, and I'll recommend somebody, if you are struggling with motivation, with drive, to get to the gym, to get off your, your backside and get to it, I'm doing the same, trust me. I, I I need to be getting back into the gym. But I procrastinate a lot due to my ADHD. That's no excuse, no excuse whatsoever. I need to do it. Um, but if you are looking for somebody to motivate you, there's a lot of people out there um, who talk about motivation and, and how to overcome things and all the rest of it. The one main person I would recommend is David Goggins. Uh, if you unfamiliar with him, check him out on YouTube, check his uh, YouTube channel out. He may be for you, he may not, but he's very blunt, he's very harsh, and he's very straight to the point. There's no dilly-dallying about with him. It's it's very, you know, it's quite brutal. But if, if, if that was what would help you, listen to his story, you know, listen to his story. Um, he's an incredible human. So definitely check him out. He inspired me. And I've, I've, I've checked out a lot of motivational people to try and motivate myself. And I've, you know, listened to a lot of audio books. I've, I've, you know, watched a lot of YouTube videos and interviews and stuff. And he is the only person that has really inspired me and sort of give me a bit of a yeah. kick. I know something that's been recurring through the conversation that we've been having and that's really you talking about it being important to have some time for yourself to have a reset or recharge your batteries. I guess really it's about maintaining your own well-being and doing things that help you with that. So you're able to carry on doing what you're doing in terms of your, your caring role. Yeah, absolutely. You can hit the nail on the head. That's exactly it. Yeah. You know, you take an hour to go and read a book. And you feel selfish because you should be with your partner supporting her and, you know, and, and doing this and doing that and, you know, doing the housework and all the rest of it. But are you sat there reading your book for selfish reasons or are you doing it because you want to look after yourself and do it for self-care? You can't argue with that. It reminds me of the conversations that we all may have in our head because I think that we can all have a dialogue in our own head <laughs> or maybe that's just me. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, we all do it. Yeah. Just brings to mind as we're talking about this uh, lyric from uh, a Bob Dylan song, Simple Twist of Fate, from his Blood on the Tracks album, where he talks about giving myself a good talking to him. Uh, maybe we all need to do that from time to time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Many thanks to Rich for talking to us and sharing with us his experiences of being a carer. If you're thinking having heard rich actually i wouldn't mind doing that i'd like to tell people a bit about my experiences and it might be helpful for them then you can get in touch very easily uh, email it's uh, podcast at northamptonshire carers.org you can call on 01933 677 907 or talk to us uh, any of us uh, that you might encounter from the organization we'd be really very pleased to hear from you 
Before we hear from uh, the first of our volunteers talking about why they volunteer for uh, a St Northamptonshire carers, here's uh, my colleague Emma from the Community Companions team to tell us a bit more about Volunteers Week. Yeah, well, Volunteers Week, Adam, is, is comes in two sides of it, really. We use it as an opportunity to celebrate and thank all the volunteers that we have across the organisation. Um, the last few years, we've done that with an afternoon tea celebration. Everybody coming together, we share some of the comments that the carers have given um, at the value of the support that the volunteers provide. We give long service awards. We're really fortunate to have many, many volunteers that have been supporting the organisation for a long time. So that's that's the one half of it. The other thing is, while there's a UK-wide look at volunteering, we use it as an opportunity to promote on social media the, the volunteer opportunities that we have to offer across um, not just the Community Companion Service, but Northamptonshire Carers as a whole. You're listening to the Northamptonshire Carers Podcast. Throughout this episode of the Northamptonshire Carers Podcast, in recognition of Volunteers Week, then uh, peppered throughout, we've got conversations with a number of uh, our volunteers from uh, various parts of the organisation. And next up, uh, a conversation that I had with Christian about his volunteering for us. Just wanted to uh, to start really by a fairly straightforward question. What led you to want to become a volunteer for the Community Companion Service? Uh, the first time I experienced uh, the, the service was when I was called to a 999 call as part of my job as a paramedic, which I've been for 20 years. There was a lady on scene uh, who was with the, pa- the patient and I said, are you their carer? And they said, no, I'm here as a companion. And I was like, oh, what's that? And they told me all about the service. And I thought, oh, wow, that's such a good idea. Uh, and I've come across lots and lots of people throughout the years in my ser- in my years of service as a paramedic where they don't have anybody with them, they don't have friends or companions, or there's elderly carers with their uh, elderly companion. And they don't get a break, they get burnt out, and it causes a lot of stress and problems. And also that person that's being cared for can get quite isolated. And the only person they have contact with is the person that's caring for them and sometimes that relationship can get a bit tense so it was just sort of like a great idea and I thought wow I'm gonna to have to look into this and I did. Yeah it's great that you did and how long uh, do you reckon that you've been volunteering now? I think I've been doing it for about five years I believe uh, I've helped quite a few people in that time I met some lovely people uh, lovely people I've cared for and looked looked after and chatted with but also their other halves as well it's been lovely to meet them all. And is that that kind of uh, one of the real sort of benefits for you of, of, of volunteering? Yeah, definitely. Like I say, I mean, to me, everybody wins from this. Uh, the person who gets a break from the caring role, they get to spend up to two hours a week uh, doing something they want to do. Sometimes, sadly, it's just going out and shopping. Uh, but other times they go out to visit little groups or they pop out for like a, a meeting with a few people out for a coffee. Uh, also, the person you're sitting with gets uh, interaction with somebody different other than a family member. Uh, where sometimes that thing's a little bit tense where you have the carer and person being cared for relationship. Uh, so they get benefit. And also I get the benefit of meeting some lovely people, like you say, the people I help, but also the people I sit with and chat with. I learn to l- l- about their lives, about their history. It's just really, really nice. And to me, everybody wins. And I, I think that the thing is that in a way, it's amazing that a couple of hours, maybe once a week or once a fortnight, and I know that you know this from your own experience of going and visiting people, what a difference that can make. Uh, it really can. Like I say, two hours doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a lot for them to have a little break. And it's also nice to see that person have that communication for two hours. And a lot of times the people I go out to really come out of their shell in those two hours. They might not talk a lot beforehand. And the first maybe a like couple of times you meet them, it's a bit sort of like guarded. But then after a couple of weeks of going in there, you're like best friends and you're really looking forward to seeing each other. They look forward to seeing you, I hope. And I really look forward to seeing them and spending time with them. I enjoy playing games with one of the gentlemen I'm with now. It's just very, very hard for me because he beats me all the time. But I still enjoy going and uh, they seem to enjoy beating me. So it's all right. And I'm a good loser. So it's okay. If you were recommending the community companion service to a carer thinking about using it, then uh, what 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 would you say sort of uh, to them to sort of say, yeah, this is this is a good service to use? 
I, like I say, in my, in my job, I've come along lots of people who I thought you could really benefit from this. And I always mention the service. So I like give them a piece of paper with some links. And I say about these are the people to look into. Uh, so it's a, such a great service. Uh, like I say, it just gives everybody a break. Uh, I go into some situations where it's either the carer or the person being cared for that I think would benefit. Or sometimes it's both. Uh, and I like suggest look into this thing. It could be really beneficial for you. It just gives you a bit of time out to go and do things, recharge your batteries. It also gives the person you're with that little bit of uh, space to chat with people and get to know other people uh, and sometimes as a case of in their life if I'm with a gentleman they sometimes don't have that male contact it's all females and the thing and they lose that male bonding contact and it's sometimes it's nice for them to chat to another man about certain things uh, one of the gentlemen I see at the minute where uh, we've been recording the rugby with the Six Nations and he waits till I'm visiting him and then we watch it together and he kind of like enjoys that I think yeah yeah that sounds great uh, well Really appreciate you having a chat about your volunteering and more importantly, thanks for thanks for all of the volunteering that you've done with this and, and long may it continue. Uh, like I say, it's been my absolute pleasure and it's definitely one of the biggest things in my life that I'm so happy that I did. Uh, I, I'm just so happy that I came across that person, looked into the service and I've been able to do what I do. I feel very privileged to have done it. I really enjoy it. I think it's such a great thing for everybody. Anybody who's out there that's interested in doing it, I suggest you really get online look for the service and click on that volunteer button because you won't regret it and neither will the people you'll help. It's such a lovely thing to be able to do. And that was Christian, who is one of our volunteers with the Community Companion Service, talking about why he does what he does for us in the way of a volunteer companion and how he came uh, to uh, find out about the service. And for this Carers and Volunteers Week combined extended edition of the Northamptonshire Carers podcast. A conversation that I had with Victoria, who has been a carer. She'll talk about that and explain what her caring role involved. But she's recently become a volunteer with us at the uh, organisation. I'm joined by Victoria, who's a volunteer with us on the admin team here at Northampton Shakar is hi Victoria. Hi Adam. Good morning. Thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time to to have a chat about your your volunteering with us. But I think that the 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 question that springs readily to mind to start with really is what brought you here? What was your journey to become a a volunteer with us at Northampton Shakar is? Well, first of all, thank you for asking me um, to share this story because it is one which was unexpected for me. Um, although I don't like to use the word journey um, to describe how life is mapped out, it really is turning into one. I was caring for my father for three years. It was deep, pandemic, chaotic, um, gruelling, rewarding in its own way. Um, but I had been working... Um, in an office so it wasn't something we planned although reducing my hours over time it was becoming more and more aware I was needed day and night but March 2020 once dad went into hospital unexpectedly not covid related our decisions were made after being furloughed in my job I stopped work and full-time carer I was. It must have been really difficult anyway as things progressed, but also thinking about during that whole time with the start of a number of lockdowns as well and going into hospital and the worries that that generated that were extra to, to normal. 100%. Being away from Dad when Dad was in hospital and I couldn't visit um, was incredibly difficult. So I started to write to Dad and drop the letters off at the hospital with a security guard. They kept moving him around different wards, but I managed to track him down. On one particular occasion, I was able to wave through the window of a ward. <laughs> Once Dad did come out of hospital, yes, it was, uh, it was territory unknown around the house, mobility health concerns no one particular illness just a a massive combination of many 
I was now not sleeping properly myself. Financially, we struggled. But ask me to do it again, and I would. In a heartbeat. Well, it sounds like it was the most, possibly the most challenging time. Because I think that the thing is that nobody, you know, you don't apply for a job to be a carer, do you? Kind of creeps up on you sometimes. Yes, it did creep up, and it crept up on Dad, because it was very independent up until then. Although I was born to elderly parents, Dad was, you know, he was the last one standing left from my parents. And up until March 2020, it didn't, we could never imagine this would happen, Adam. We never saw it on the horizon. And we found ourselves in it with lockdowns. And so the way that I used to say to Dad was everything, the whole world's changed now. So we'll, we'll we'll do this together. We'll we'll get through it. We didn't know how long. We didn't know it was going to be three years. You don't. You, you the, 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 there's no no way that you can predict that, is there? Really, that the time that you're going to be in that caring role, and it, I think is. I mean, you know this from your own experience. It brings its rewards. It brings its challenging times. But to do that during that unprecedented period of time, when we talk about lockdown. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but I kind of think it seems bizarre that we're even talking about that. That, that Did that actually happen? I know it did, but... Uh... Yes, and even, even adjusting to that would have been difficult. I think COVID gave me and Dad a gift. Strangely, neither of us actually caught it, which is amazing. Um, but what it gave, it forced our hand to spend time together um i was able to show dad what i was capable of to look after him where he'd worked many years as a postman pounding the streets of kettering delivering posts in all weathers um i was able to to show dad what i was capable of now and i learned a lot about myself things i never would imagine i'd be capable of Uh, dad got to know me better perhaps and maybe some of that is, is, is the obviously the set of circumstances that arose, but also perhaps because of the whole nature of, of coronavirus and the lockdown and stuff, going to other places, movement was quite restricted for quite a lot of that time, wasn't it? That, that, that you were in that care or the start of that caring role. So, but I'm kind of thinking, well, maybe bizarrely out of a set of circumstances that you wouldn't have thought were perhaps the best. Maybe there was a silver lining element that you got to spend that time in the way that you did. There really was, and and where Dad would have once upon a time, and, and he was feeling guilty, he had no reason to, but because I was an active gym member and I had friends out of work and, and I almost came and went as I pleased, Dad felt guilty, but I used to say to him regularly, well, you mustn't, because... Covid stopped me going to the gym. The pandemic stopped me going to the coffee shop or the gym or all this, Dad. So we were quite at peace with each other. Um, and to be able to spend that quality time, box sets, we watched many, repeated. And to cook for Dad and arrange all the hospital, you know, a lot of appointments, medications. You, you, you know, I'm... It's, yes, yeah, a big learning curve, but there's a lot of fondness to, to look back on because um, just, just, just to tell the listeners that I lost my dad in January. Must have been really difficult, as it is anyway, but particularly after having that time time together where you were being a real support and, and really getting ch- a chance to, to know one another, really, in a different way. Yes, yes, in a different way and... I almost felt like if there could ever be a right time, it was a right time. It was the day before what would have been Mum's birthday. It was just after Christmas. We'd spent a very peaceful Christmas together, pleasant, peaceful. And everything had been said that could be said. Um, I feel... 
almost like Dad chose his time, if that's possible. I think that what you've said there that sort of struck me particularly is that comment about everything was said. And I think that it's often something that people don't do. So so did that help in a way as, as things, obviously when you lost your dad, I, I do understand from my own experiences how, how difficult that is. Um, but did that kind of help that you'd actually talked about everything that you, you wanted to talk about in some way? Yes, it, it, it was, it, it, because it wasn't sudden and it was almost everything we'd swept up, so to speak. We'd rehearsed many things. We, a lot of practical conversations, um, you know, we, not, not so much the affectionate ones, but that wasn't what me and Dad were about. And if something terrible such as Dad passing would have happened 18 months before, we weren't ready. But if I had to choose a time when we were ready, it was almost, we couldn't have been a better time. You're talking there about practical decisions. I know that in maybe British culture, then we are perhaps not always great at talking about things that actually are pretty important to talk about. Um, so did you talk about some of, some of those things, about th- things like funeral arrangements and what he wanted and what he didn't want and those kinds of things? Yes, um, um, down down to the wire and, and, and many rehearsed conversations and what I will be doing and what and, and funeral arrangements were were prepped and and financially, as Dad was very concerned about the future um all the i's were dotted and the t's were crossed and that gave dad reassurance so i i don't know if if you can choose your time but i think my dad did yeah it's it's interesting how that can feel that way doesn't it isn't it really and 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 i think as as, as well i i think all of us in in life sadly will experience the loss of loved ones and maybe a bit, as you've been saying, and I know from my experiences that that kind of having those conversations, the conversations that we would tend to shy away from, the practical ones, it doesn't make it easy, but it you, you know that you're doing the right thing absolutely for that person um, when that difficult time comes. 100% I'll say that, Adam, because now I know Dad was at peace with... Because I'm still his little girl and I always will be. But if I could um, explain to him how I was going to then cope practically without Dad, then that made him relax more. So yes, I I recommend any practical and organisational decisions to be made in advance. And that doesn't mean you don't care. It, It means actually you care a great deal more i think i think in a, in a in a way it's 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 potentially one of the most caring things that you can do because you're you you're ensuring that you're meeting your loved one's wishes that's something that's really important isn't it for them and for you definitely because they they know that they are leaving you um and to think now i'm proud that i have managed to navigate my way through the very, very dark days of January, February, um, not being able to leave the room, not being able to draw the curtains back. It was, I know we're only now in May, but the the difference in that is not just natural light and a longer day with our time change, but also the fact that Dad could see I was fully capable. And that is something that that is pretty significant isn't it really that uh, for yourself I mean oh definitely yes and and then with those matters settled grief will always be with me forever but once again to honour my dad's values in life um, and the the need to hold your head high and self-respect find a job 
Victoria and uh, and look after yourself. I found one morning in particular, I rang the bell at Northamptonshire Carers. Linda opened the door and I said, I'd like to volunteer here, please. No longer did I have dark days. I had something to focus on to become a volunteer if if the caring for dad was the was the grueling marathon this really is the prize that's fantastic to come through and I, I really appreciate you talking about things that I think that actually it's important for more of us to talk about but it can be quite difficult sometimes and I do understand that um, but I, I, I think that the fact that you kind of found us and knocked on the door that day and what's it been like since since you've been volunteering well it's just so unexpected it's unexpected in the sense my confidence has grew um which if i return to 2021 i would have said that's just not possible um i can't imagine feeling upbeat in the aftermath of of still grieving for dad but being able to put that aside once again we're talking about being practical and organized which is a bit clinical but the grief will be there when i go home again um and it's still with me and dad is still with me but i have a focus a structure uh which is great sounds like that's something that you both enjoy and is 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 really really beneficial for you and your own well-being but equally obviously it makes a real difference to us because you're coming in and supporting colleagues in in the admin side of of, of our organization uh, which is a really important element of it and, and being part of that and being part of the team is is something that's very much valued it's great i'm really pleased that 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 uh, that you made that decision to knock on the door that day i don't actually remember walking to the door that day <laughs> but i felt that it just that particular morning I was the next thing I was I was you know I was here knocking on the door and and I was guided to be a volunteer and it's such a it's an ever so nice place to be made to feel welcome and also to to benefit my own well-being as well I think that's the important thing it's a balance isn't it really you've gone through through your own experiences and I think that experiences as, as yours have, and each of us will have our own different experiences in life. I think that they kind of inform you. And even though it's difficult at the time, I think what I'm hearing from what you've been saying, there were difficult times, there were good times, but you actually came away with something positive, actually, at, at, at the end of all of that. And you're kind of channeling that now into looking at your own well-being and doing something that is good for you and good for us as an organization and good for the carers that we support i guess the other thing as well is that that would i be right in thinking that it's kind of nice to work for a a, a charity that supports unpaid carers on a volunteer basis that kind because you've been there. yes yes it, it does it all makes sense now and where i was phoning the support line when I was at home with dad and I was being helped and helped around the the system of being a, a full-time carer which was territory unknown um when I'd relay all this to dad and and, and talk about the organization uh, it all fits it's like the opposite side now and and being around those within the building who who are working with people like me at the end of the phone who were struggling it was difficult it's the opposite side and I'll go as far as to say for my future where I will have to find paid work I'm not going to call this this is this is unpaid work which is um, incredibly rewarding but you know due to financial restraints but my action plan with Job Centre Plus is to run my volunteer work at Northamptonshire Carers parallel to part-time paid employment. So it's something, it can be something I don't want to give up. For this Carers Week special, I met up with Joy, who's a former carer, and here's our conversation. I cared for my partner for eight years. He had a 
various disabilities and is mobility reduced. And then last June, he became very seriously ill and it turned out to be cancer, terminal cancer. And he died within three weeks. And I can remember that first time when he died and I came home from hospital and I knew he wasn't coming home, the house was empty. Everything to do with my caring role was still there. The room, the way the room was organised and everything. And um, it was just such an odd feeling. Um, very raw, I was very emotional obviously because he'd only just died. And I kind of, I was working part time and I had a, a week off work purely to go through his personal things, go through items that I felt obviously would no longer be used. And it was just, it became a really odd feeling every day getting up and I'd always, the first thought in my head was a cup of tea, medication, is he even awake? You know, that, that was my yeah. first thing before I did anything else. Um, and and it just it just wasn't there, and I found I I hadn't got things to fill my time, um, the responsibility that I had, I didn't have to kind of think about things, forward plan things, because when you're a carer, you are a little restricted. I mean, depending on the disabilities of the person that you're caring for, you are restricted to what you can do and when you can do it because you have those responsibilities sure. yeah. but I just didn't I didn't have it and and it I can only describe it as a really lost kind of starting to feel quite lonely feeling yeah. um my son lives in the house he's, he's still there but he worked full time um and it just it just wasn't wasn't the same you try to do the normal things you know you're registering the death and then gradually gradually it becomes more real that that person has gone and then your role that you had before has gone and um i just didn't have the same things to do with my day i think i think that, that it's it's interesting what you're saying ar around the fact that it's almost it, it feels uh, like a, a kind of double loss obviously the loss of your partner but also the fact that there's a lot to do if you're a carer as you're saying that you're sort of commenting on the fact that the, there's some restriction when you're a carer of not being able to do things uh, or having to plan things a lot more perhaps that yeah. so that's quite a an amount of space what helped i suppose to to kind of navigate your way through that and i'm i'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that it it's probably still an ongoing thing to some extent. It's very much, it, it does go through the phases, but I think that initial week that I took off work, because I just took one week off work, it was filled with sorting things through, doing essential paperwork, the things that had to be done. Um, and then gradually we began to sort the house out because there was rather a lot of clutter. Then it was things like getting rid of the hospital bed, aids and appliances that he'd used, making sure they all went back or we we donated what we could. Um, and then I went back to work and the role I have for my work is as a home help. So in a way, although I didn't have any caring responsibilities, I did used to do things like shopping and a little bit of cleaning for people. And it was just chatting and making a cup of tea and possibly a sandwich. So that that did help. I'd known all my people that I visit for a long time. They were aware of why I'd had the week off. And so I spoke to them about what had happened and that was fine. And then I'd get home and I'd get home to this more and more empty house echoing. And my son was, as I say, working full time. What I think helped me is that I have dogs. And I think I wouldn't have bothered getting up in the morning if it wasn't for my one dog in particular. He comes up on the landing and he wakes me up every morning for breakfast without fail. 
don't need a, an alarm at all. And I would get up and the dogs would have their breakfast and we'd go down the garden and I'd do the essential poop picking up and that sort of thing. Yeah. And then I'd go on, go on to work. Um, and I was involved with the community law people, which are based here at the Anne Goodman Centre. I was getting some help and support from them. And I came down one day and I found a booklet and it was a carer's booklet. And I opened it up and I got to a page and it had a, I think it was a lovely sunset. And it said horizons. And I read it and it said bereaved former carers. And I just thought that's me, that is me. So I looked at the contact number and I just thought, oh, it's a phone call, what can I lose? I'm not, you know, not gonna meet anybody. Yeah. I'm just gonna talk to them on the phone. And the lady was so nice that I spoke to, so encouraging, and she gave me all the information about when the next group was. And I thought, right, I'll give it a go. Because I I think, I was trying to talk to other people, but they weren't carers. They didn't quite understand that void that I felt. So I decided I'd come to the next Wednesday group and I can remember finding a parking space in Midland Road, which is quite a rare thing. Um, I sat in the car. And I sat in the car and I thought, shall I go in? What am I here for? Why am I doing this? <laughs> and then I just got my big girl pants on, got out of the car and I came in. And it was the best decision I could have made because I, walked, I, knew, I was familiar with this building. I did know this building from years ago when it used to be the family centre. So it wasn't like I was going somewhere totally yeah, unknown so. and I walked through the door and I was met with this lovely smiling face would you like a cup of tea and I thought that's fine and I sat down and people were laughing they were because I thought am I going to go into something where people are really maudling and I'm going to feel really not so yeah. happy and yeah it was really good there was people laughing they were talking they were joking um, teasing one another and I thought oh this sounds like my thing you know um, so yeah I sat down and I was welcomed into the group um, Lisa and uh, Kirsty and uh, Chrissy I hope I've got their names right um, they introduced me and, and, and everything um, and they were just a really nice bunch of people um, and at that time I could eat chocolate biscuits and we had chocolate biscuits as well and I think a cup of tea and biscuits always helps was was there something for you in that kind of sense of being with a group of people that had a shared experience? Absolutely, because people, once the introductions had been had, before the sort of agenda of the group started, people were actually talking to me and they were saying, who have you lost? How long has it been? And at that point, I think when I joined the group, it had only been three, four months. So it was very, very new. And then they shared their experience of somebody had been caring for their wife for 25 years. 25 years and was suddenly left. Um, so yes, it was. It was very nice. And they were just, as I say, they were just really pleasant people and everybody was talking. So, yeah. yeah. I'm imagining there was probably a sense of trepidation Though before you before you walk through, you're thinking about you're talking about sitting in your car. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just wondering if there was a sense of how can this be me? I I did. I can remember sitting in my car thinking, what am I doing here? What what is this? Yeah, what what is this going to be about? But I knew I had to do it once. If it wasn't right, you don't have have to come again. But I'm so glad. And apart from being on holiday, I've come to every group and then yeah. you get so many you're offered so many activities you know so many things to do that it's it just it just really helps me yeah and you and, and you continue to come along that you're in the group group this morning we had two new two new members came this morning um newly bereaved uh, people and i know what that feels yeah. like lady was saying I was a bit nervous about coming through the door and I said I felt exactly like you did. But she left, she was smiling. She said she'd see us at the next month's group. So I guess that was 
successful you know yeah no, that, that uh is sounds exactly what what you need isn't it really that that and i think as well that that as well as obviously the shared experience of losing somebody or or maybe somebody that you're caring for moving into residential care which is another kind of sense of loss loss and bereavement as well isn't it role is gone there as well yeah. just sort of picking up on the fact that you also had that experience that you could share with with the new person coming into the session today of it being a first time that you walked through the door and had those feelings of I'm not quite sure what to expect is it going to be all right is this going to be for me all of those normal human things that we all yeah. experience yeah, it, it was the same routine would you like a cup of tea help yourself to chocolate biscuits and it just it just breaks yeah. the ice it's that sounds like you'd certainly recommend that if people are kind of mulling over the idea of picking up the phone or, or, or coming along to uh, one of the horizon sessions that that it might be worth them giving it a whirl then i would definitely recommend it because it isn't a sad place there is, if you need that, there is a telephone helpline. You don't have to discuss anything personal in front of the group. You don't have to share anything you don't want to share. But if you just get that terrible pang one day, that awful feeling in your stomach, and although it's coming up for a year, I do still get it, and you want to talk to somebody, there is a helpline yeah. there, yeah. and you can talk on a one-to-one -one for as long as you like. Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so you've always got that option available. That, that's something that you've said there is is really significant because grief is an ongoing process. Just because it's been three months or six months or a year or a year and a half or whatever, it doesn't mean to say you don't experience grief. It might be slightly different, but, but it still is there, isn't it? So Everybody's journey is different. It makes sounds a cliche, but... It is different and I think you go through the different phases at different times um, and and f my personal journey is I've acknowledged all of my emotions I haven't denied myself feeling sad or I haven't felt guilty when I've had a happy day myself and doing something completely different and not feeling guilty because I'm supposed to be sad, I can enjoy my happiness yeah. times. Yeah. But there are times when it's not so positive, but I do, em I do embrace it. It's not gonna last, it isn't gonna last, and, and it will be fine. And I think, think that, that, that there is that maybe perception and something that we can sometimes do to ourselves, which is this idea that, that uh, you can't be happy or, or you can't have a day when you're kind of feeling a bit more uplifted but it sounds like the group helps with that as well yeah, yeah we do we have like a whatsapp uh, group as well and like you that's used to remind people that the group is on or to an event that's coming up or something like that um but there is a another helpline as i say that isn't shared with the group that you can do on a one-to-one -one. thanks thanks so much for talking about all of that so i think that in life there's so many things that actually really important to talk about this is one of them so so it's great you have felt able to, to talk about your own experiences and I think that other people will find that really useful you're very welcome it's a carers week and volunteers week special for episode four of the Northamptonshire carers podcast and let's take a listen to a conversation that one of our volunteers Claire had with me telling me about how she came to be a volunteer with the service and how she's found that experience. I just thought that it might be interesting to start to, by asking what led you to want to become a, a volunteer for uh, the Community Companion Service. Okay, so I've had quite a few volunteer experiences and I've always enjoyed doing something like this um, aside my main job. Yeah, when I when I work, I always feel like there's a bit of something myth, missing, you know, that I'd like, and I find that in volunteering. So, I've when I was younger, I did one-to-one um, -one volunteering as well, which I really enjoy, which was mentoring uh, children. So I mentored first a sixteen-year-old boy for one year on a weekly basis. And I also mentored a nine-year-old boy later on for one year. 
and it was an amazing experience. And that's what I like. I like one-to-ones and uh, building a relationship with somebody. When I had a bit more time, I thought, okay, what can I do now? I, I work, you know, four days a week. I'd like to do some volunteering in my fifth day. And I researched uh, what I would could do that I liked, and I just came across Northern Pension Carers. And uh, that's where I am. It, it sounds like you've got that real taste for volunteering and and, and that's something that's quite important to you yes it is it brings something i don't get in my um in my work um you know and i find it changes my whole week to have this it just um i don't know you know like when you just do different things in life and you have friends who are different and bring different things to you and what you do as well is the same i just find that really fulfilling to to have both alongside how long do you do you reckon you've been volunteering for us now over four years and what do you see as the the benefits of of, of volunteering i mean you, you talked a, a few moments ago about about some of that but what what would you say that you you sort of get out of actually going to to do a visit to somebody for us well it makes me happy to see that you know i've made a difference to somebody so when i see this lady Every time I enter the room, you know, I only have to say, oh, hello, and do a big smile, and her face lights up, and uh, she knows we're going to go out, um, she knows she's going to have a special time in her week, which is when I come and we go out, and uh, it just makes her happy, and it's so nice to see that, because for me, it's not much, you know, to take her out, and it's it's quite nice to see that even if she has a bad week from her health point of view, she will gather all her en- energy to for the day and she will she will make that day. She will be out with me and have fun and even if she's in pain, you know, she'll forget about it for a few hours. And um she she's beaming in this moment, so it's very nice. Something that I say quite often is the fact that a couple of hours or three hours a week might not seem like a great deal but it can actually make quite a difference and I wondered what your thoughts were on that Claire. It's very interesting because before I started I didn't think much about it and about the dynamic but so when I come to the house I always see her daughter and this lady they're sitting in the living room and um, when I come in we have a chat together and I can see you know it's really nice for the daughter to have a chat as well. She enjoys it and I get on well with her and we just enjoy our chit chat. And then, I, you know, then we go out or I spend time with this lady. But it makes, a, it makes a difference to everyone in the household, really. Yes, I feel in this uh, relationship, I feel it's been really important for the daughter, you know, to trust me with her venerable mother. So she was happy from the first minute um the lady i see and very open and very chatty and i think it took a bit longer for her daughter to you know trust me go out i can bring her back if if the daughter is not here it doesn't matter um i just tell her what i'm doing and that's enough you know she trusts me and it's fine it's a bit like you know a family here for me so you we give each other small presents at christmas you know she'll want to treat my children as well. Is there anything that you particularly like to say to someone that might be uh, considering looking at some volunteering with us? Uh, I just said just just try it because you will find something you like in it. You don't know in advance what it's going to be but you will you will find some satisfaction and um, everyone is different so it's very enriching. You're listening to the Northamptonshire Carers Podcast. Time now to hear from Pam, who's a volunteer with us, has been for a number of years. She volunteers for our community companion service. Just wanted to start by asking you what led you to think, uh, I'd like to become a volunteer for the community companion service. Well, after I lost my husband, I felt I'd got time on my hands and I wanted to give something back to the community. And I thought volunteering was the best thing to do. And if I remember correctly, you were in a caring role for for your husband as well, weren't you? I was indeed. He had a stroke. So obviously I needed to care for him. And I'm imagining as well that that kind of gave you 
a pretty good insight into from your real life experience what being a carer is like and as a result why a service like this was perhaps quite an important one of course it did and I realized that people often needed help often people just think about the person that's poorly or needing care but they don't think about the actual carer and that's where this service really can work because it gives you a bit of a break that so when you were a carer did you manage to get a break well I did because family would help out and friends so that was fine but I do realize that there are lots of families out there that haven't got anybody to help them and that's where I thought I could help we might both str- struggle with this go back in time but so when how long have you been volunteering do you reckon um well I started before Covid but obviously then didn't do anything within Covid so it's been three three years plus. And is there uh, something that you kind of feel that you, you yourself get from, from, from going out and doing a visit to somebody for the service? Well yes I don't do it for myself but obviously it's, it's good to feel that you're helping others and that makes me feel good because there might be a time in my life when I might need the service we don't know what's around the corner. I've given to the community and hope that in time, if necessary, I'd get that help as well. Sure, yeah. And is there a a sort of uh, reason particularly that you kind of thought, well, Northampton Shakaras is is, is the organisation for me in this this service? Well, I saw it advertised. I'd already done some caring work at a local hospital. Um, but I didn't feel I was appreciated enough there. So I wanted more of a one-to-one thing, really, so that you can build up a rapport with the people that you're visiting and they become, well, a bit like friends, I suppose, really. It's important for all of us, isn't it, that sense of um, knowing that we're valued? Definitely. And obviously the previous job, I didn't see the same people all the time. So, yeah, they weren't that interested in talking to me sometimes and I didn't get anything from it I wanted to give and um, hope that they got something from me and I think you're right that it's also it's about building building that rapport and with that sort of continuity and 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 seeing people on a fairly regular basis that you can achieve that kind yes you can yes and you get to know their likes and their dislikes they get to know you about your family because obviously with the two-way conversation um yeah, it becomes more of a friendship, really. In the time that you've been volunteering, that from visiting regularly, your confidence and the folks that you're visiting kind of builds in the sense that often conscious of the fact that somebody that a carer may not know particularly well going in to do a visit, it's quite a big step for somebody to take, isn't it? It is a big step. But the last gentleman that I was sitting with used to really look forward to me going. And when I was leaving, it would be, when are you coming again? And even when I visited him in hospital, it was, when are you coming again? Because we'd built up a rapport. And just to end, Pam, what would you say to anybody who may be considering volunteering for us across the organisation or indeed for community companions? I think you have to be a certain type of person to become a volunteer anyway, because if you're... If you're not a giver, then there's no point in doing it whatsoever. Um, But, as I said earlier, you know, it's giving something back to the people around us and society. And I just think that we all ought to do more volunteer work. It will make the world a better place. And that was Pam, who's one of our volunteers uh, with Community Companions. If you've been inspired by hearing what Pam has said and feel, uh, yeah, this is something that would be interesting, I'd quite like to do that, then uh, we'd love to hear from you. You can do that. uh, If it's Community Companions, you can get in touch on uh, the phone, 01933 677 907. You can apply online at our website, northamptonshire-carers.org, and uh, how you can help us and slip through to the option for volunteering. If you're interested in volunteering in other bits of the organisation, maybe in admin or groups, a range of other areas really, then uh, the best thing to do is contact uh, the office on 01933 677907 and ask to uh, speak to Linda Tiffany. And last but by no means least, 15th to the 21st of May 
is Mental Health Awareness Week for this year. Particularly timely, I think, in relation to the fact that during the whole COVID lockdowns and the isolation that came with that, and some of the isolation that's continued with that, then perhaps as Dr. David Smart said on the April edition of the podcast, that that whole experience finally led to a bit more of a recognition of the fact that people will and do experience mental health issues. And this year, anxiety is the uh, topic for Mental Health Awareness Week. And the Mental Health Foundation, just one of many organisations that are trying to promote and raise awareness and encourage people to talk about mental health, say on their website, we've chosen anxiety as Mental Health Awareness Week theme this year to kickstart a nationwide conversation, encouraging people to share their own experiences and any helpful ideas on how they manage anxiety, the words of Alexa Knight, Director of England at the uh, Mental Health Foundation. There's certainly resources on their website. There's uh, resources on the, the MIND website, Rethink, and, of course, many others. What I would say as one of the most important things is to for all of us to, to acknowledge that we will and do and can indeed experience mental health issues. And I think it's important to be open about that, that I've experienced through life periods of depression. I never think there's anything wrong with acknowledging that. It's actually much better to do that because we will all experience this. And by talking yourself, then it might enable somebody else to talk. I'll leave you with that thought for uh, for this month. And that almost brings us to the end of this May edition of the Northamptonshire Carers podcast. Thanks for listening. And if you know friends who are in a caring role that might be interested but haven't stumbled upon the podcast yet, then uh, please do share. We'll be back at the end of June with uh, another edition in which uh, I'll be talking for the uh, whole duration of the podcast to a really interesting uh, guy called uh, Pete Middleton. I'll be talking about his experiences of living with dementia and, and as he puts it, living well with dementia. If you've been inspired by what you've heard on this podcast and want to come along to some of our Carers Week events, then uh, please check out the details on our website and on our social media, Facebook, uh, Twitter and Instagram. You, uh, of course, are very welcome. We'd certainly uh, be delighted to hear from you if uh, you think, actually, I quite fancy volunteering or I know somebody that might be interested in that. Then you can give us a call on 01933 677 907. And you can also find details on our website, northamptonshire-carers.org, of course, and find the tab for the page that says how you can support us and click through to volunteering from there you can find more details and apply online if that's uh, what you would like to do there's an online application form now though it's time to exit stage left as the phrase goes as it's closing time i'll speak to you next month this podcast is created by northamptonshire carers and is a man with a beard production